Well, welcome to the first colloquium of the year. Thank you for showing up, and it's our great pleasure to have one of our newest colleagues as the introductory colloquium speaker. Uh, Judith Sue received her bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering at MIT, and then I would have to look at my notes to see she got her PhD at Caltech in biomedical something or other. Um, biochemistry and molecular. Biochemistry and molecular biophysics. That's what I said. Um, <laughs> and um, so she holds joint appointments in um, biomedical engineering and optical sciences. And it's our great pleasure to have here what she is working on now and what she will be working on. So, Dr. Sue. Thanks for the very nice introduction, Charlie. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. I'm very honored to be giving the first colloquium. I'm very excited to be able to tell you guys all about the work I do in my lab, which is mainly centered on using optical microcavities, which are a very, very versatile platform for very sensitive biological and chemical sensing. And I had wanted to say that I think I know most of the faculty, but I'm particularly excited today to be able to share my work with all the students and postdocs in the room. So I'm currently hiring people. I'm cur I have several positions open. I'm looking for postdocs and graduate students. I am part, as Charlie mentioned, I'm part of the College of Engineering. So I'm in biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering is also part of the College of Medicine. And I'm part of the College of Optical Sciences. And so we have good interaction with all three colleges, which is very, very useful to the, for the extremely interdisciplinary work that my lab does. Okay, so since I'm meeting most of these students for the first time, I thought I'd give a little introduction about myself. So I'm from Boca Raton, Florida. That's my hometown. That's where I grew up, and that's where I spent all my time prior to college. So I, and then I went to MIT, and I got my bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering. I did a lot of work in imaging and cell mechanics there. When I was an undergrad, I did a lot of work in fluid mechanics, oddly enough. And then I went to Caltech for graduate school, and now I'm very excited to be starting my independent career here at the University of Arizona. Um, very, very excited. Uh, here's a picture that I took from my kitchen window. This is a wildcat that's just walking down our driveway. And certainly we wouldn't be able to see anything like that in any of the other places I live. So for us, this has like, been quite a fascinating adventure. How about coconuts? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, there are alligators in Florida. That's true. <laughs> so this is my lab. We call it the Little Sensor Lab. Um, so you can see we have a number of very, very talented people from a lot of top programs and schools from all over the world. I can see a lot of them are in the audience today. Uh, Yao actually just arrived today. I can see him sitting over there. <laughs> I don't have his picture, so I put this picture of a toroid, which um, Errol and Jaden took. Um, so, <laughs> so you can, I, I, I put people's schools and their sort of departments up on this slide so you could see sort of the diversity of fields that I have in my lab. Our work is extremely interdisciplinary. And I particularly wanted to mention our two undergrads, uh, Kara and Shelby. I'm very supportive of undergraduate research in my lab. In fact, Kara just had a poster accepted to the Biomedical Engineering Society Conference in Phoenix next month. And Rudy is not in our lab, but he donated this microscope, which is why we're in this picture. So, uh, so we have a, a group of very talented and hardworking people in our lab. And I would like to mention that I'm thinking about doubling the size of my lab in the next year or so. And so, in particular, if you've emailed me in the past looking for a job and I was perhaps less than enthusiastic, now is actually a good time to be emailing me. So, the work I do in my lab is on uh, biological and chemical sensing, and we're very interested in very, very sensitive sensing. And so, a particular concern to us is single molecule detection. For us, that's the ultimate limit of detection. You can't get better than single molecule detection. And so, why is this important? So, it's important for a variety of reasons. It's important for basic fundamental studies, and it's also important for applied studies. So, for Basic fundamental studies, you can answer, we're hoping to look at large questions such as protein folding, and that's very important because form dictates function. So if you're able to understand how or how something folds, you can understand and hopefully control how, how protein functions. This would have enormous implications in human health. I'm sure many of you guys can appreciate that proteins regulate all the tissues and organs in your body. They do things like carry oxygen. They're, vari they're responsible. They're essentially the workers of your cells. And things like motor protein, protein movement can only be looked at at the single molecule level. And I think what a lot of people get very, very excited about is if you're able to detect very, very low concentrations of molecules down to the single molecule limit, you can look at trace detections of biomarkers for various diseases. So cancer, Alzheimer's, these are projects that we have ongoing in my lab. And you can also look at public health detection of bacteria and viruses, so environmental monitoring. And these approaches are useful because you can directly look at molecular properties so you don't have to make an ensemble bulk measurement and use a model to sort of infer properties about what you're looking at. You don't have to switch states of molecules so you don't have to take a million molecules, synchronize them all on or off at once, and say, well, this is the behavior from a million molecules. What is the behavior of one molecule? 
And of course, if you can look at very, very low concentrations of molecules, this can greatly reduce the amount of analyte that's required. So this is very, very important for people whose material is very, very precious or hard to get, very rare materials. Um, and of course, this can greatly reduce the amount of money that's required. And so one advantage of our approach of using optical microcavities is that it's what is known as a label-free approach. And so why is a label-free approach important? So particularly for those of you guys who have done a lot of microscopy, labels are tags that make single molecules easier to detect. So some examples are fluorescent markers, radioactive tags, enzymatic labels, quantum dots. But they can be expensive. Um, they can be difficult to generate. You can't always get them when you want them where you want them. So particularly for point of care applications, if you wanted to tag very, very quickly, like that, something that might not manifest. They're disruptive. Fluorescent tags can bleach. Quantum dots can blink. And they're complicated. Studies can often require multiple tags. So this is particularly true for FRET studies. And so I, I have on this slide a picture of GFP, which is probably the most widely known fluorescent marker. It's green fluorescent protein. And it's right next to interleukin-2, which is a cell signaling molecule. And you can see that they're roughly the same size. So if you were to conjugate one to the other, you could see how that might perturb the kinetics of what you might be interested in studying. And so the one major advantage of our technique is that the microtroid can eliminate the need for labels. So what's currently available? So currently, the gold standard for label-free biomolecular interaction is Biacore surface plasmid resonance. So Biacore is a company that was sold to General Electric in 2006 for $390 million. And it operates based on the principle of surface plasmid resonance. So you see here, light reflects off the back of this gold sensor chip. And this sort of, and as molecules bind, this changes the angle of minimum reflected intensity that reaches the sensor. That's because at your resonance angle, some of the light is absorbed by this gold chip. And so this is an experiment that I did where I took um, streptavidin, I bound it to the surface of this gold sensor chip, and I flowed in biotinylated protein G. So I did a half log dilution series. I started out at 316 nanomolars, and I went all the way down to atomolars. And this last line that says 3.16 nanomolars is actually an overlap of nine orders of magnitude of concentration that you simply can't see because that's below the limit of detection of the BIA core. And so concentrations are lower than this for a wide variety of applications. And so we're actually nine orders of magnitude more sensitive than this device. And so our design goal is we want something very, very, very sensitive and very fast. And so on the top of this curve, you can see current technologies that are out there and in comparison to our technique. So right here is surface plasmid resonance. This is what I just mentioned earlier about where you have this resonance angle and this condition changes when molecules bind to the surface of this gold sensor chip. Um, these are sus this is suspended microchannel resonator, so you have a beam that's bound on both ends. When particles bind, you're looking at the mechanical vibrations of that beam. Um, th these are nanowires. This is a lateral flow assay, commonly known as a pregnancy test. This is a microring resonator. This is a quartz crystal microbalance. This is a biobarcode assay. This is immunofluorescence, and these are also microcantilevers. And this dotted line represents the present state of the art. And you can see, typically, if you want to detect something that's of a very low concentration, you need a very, very long analysis time. And our technique is something that's very, very sensitive and very vast compared to what's currently out there. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about the platform that we use, which is based on microtroid optical resonators, how it works, what other people have done in the field, just to put our work in context, the advances that we've made. I'm going to show you some results from beads, which is how we first characterized our technology. Um, because it's very obvious what the size of the beads are or what the materials are, so we, it's very easy to make theoretical predictions. Um, I'm going to talk to you about our first clinical application, and I'm going to talk to you about the work that other people are doing in my lab. Okay. So optical microcavities belong to a class of techniques known as, they're known as whispering gallery mode resonators. I'm, some of you may or may not have heard about these before. And they're named after acoustic whispering galleries. And this was sort of first described by Lord Rayleigh in 1910. What he did was he stood under the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and what he noticed that were, was that sounds at one end, whispers at one end of the dome could be heard 40 meters away at the other end because sound could skirt along the edges with negligible loss. There's actually a gallery underneath this dome called this whispering gallery. And toroids are the optical analog of this, except they use light instead of sound. So this is actually, uh, two months ago, my husband and I were in Beijing. We were giving talks at Peking University, among other places. And this is the echo wall, which is in the Temple of Heaven, Beijing. And so here's you, and this is me, and we could hear each other even though we're rather far apart because sound goes along the edges of the wall. And I find this to be a fascinating example because it's actually 500 years earlier than what Lord Rayleigh described. And so, yeah, we, were, it was, we had a very, very packed schedule, but I insisted on going to the Temple of Heaven and going to the Echo Wall. And so these whispering gallery mode resonators, people have fabricated them in all sorts of materials, all sorts of shapes. But when you're talking about biological sensing, the three shapes or the three types that you're going to most commonly see are the sphere, the ring and the toroid. And so what you see on the left on this cover of Nature 
is a microsphere. And it's, this is a picture that's taken from Kerry Bahala's lab at Caltech. And what he did was he took, these are formed by melting the tip of an optical fiber in a hydrogen torch or a CO2 laser. And we can routinely make these in my lab. But what you see here is this green light, is, it's been doped with the rare earth element erbium. So you can see the light lasing within the sphere. So you can see the light orbiting within the spheres. And I remember when I first started graduate school, I saw this, this sort of this article about Kerry, and it was called Kerry Bahala and his miniature lasing spheres. And so this is actually quite a famous picture. And what you can't see in this picture is actually how light is actually coupled into this sphere. It's actually evanescently coupled using an optical fiber. So if the contrast was better, you would see an optical fiber on the back, on the back end of this. And this is a simulation of a microring. The bright colors represent the electric field within the device. So this is a waveguide. So light enters the waveguide and evanescently couples into the microring. Um, you see this constructive amplification of light within the device. This is because this happens when the circumference of your device is equal to an integer number times the wavelength of light going through your device. Um, so you get this constructive interference. You can see the colors are getting brighter. Um, and right here is where you would put a tunable laser. So you would essentially tune through a variety of wavelengths until you found this sort of resonance condition. And you see destruction, destructive amplification occurring in this waveguide because as light exits the, the ring because it's gone through this 180 degree uh, phase trip. So it's been phase shifted and you get this destructive interference. And here's where you put a photo detector. This is how you would track resonance. And this is the platform that we use. This is a microtroid. This is a picture taken from Lan Yang's group. Um, it's essentially sort of these ring resonators which have been fire polished and are on a pedestal. So they're lifted from the noise of the background up on this pedestal. And so you don't have to deal with light scattering off your substrate and whatnot. And so this is a simulation. This is a waveguide. This is actually an add drop filter. So you have a waveguide here and a waveguide there. And you're going to see light entering here. You're going to see constructive amplification within the ring. And you're going to see destructive, amplifi destructive interference within the waveguide, which is where you would put a detector. So you see light couples within the ring. When it goes around again, you're going to see this increase in the intensity as you get this amplification. And this is just going to play again. And so if you were to change the circumference or you were changing the resonance frequency, you would sort of break this resonance condition. Okay. So this is just to explain to you the detection principles of how our devices work. So this is an SEM. This is a Vertoroid. We typically work with things that are on 80 to 100 microns. So they have a relatively large capture area compared to these sort of other devices that are used for biosensing, like cantilevers and whatnot. Um, this is a cross-section. So it has a dumbbell cross-section. So the way you interpret this is that this dashed line is here. And then when you rotate this all the way around, you would get this structure. And because of this bent interface, for those of you guys who've done like turf microscopy, you know this generates an evanescent wavefront. And when particles enter the evanescent wavefront, this causes slight changes in the index of refraction, which causes changes in the resonance frequency of your device. And just to give you some numbers, your, this, for very high quality devices, the toroid has a photon lifetime of 270 nanoseconds. So in this time, light will travel around the toroid 270,000 times, or 68 meters. So it's like a cuvette that's 68 meters long, but it can fit inside your pocket. And so a single photon interacts with your analyte molecules multiple times, thereby increasing sensitivity. So particles bind to this. You have this, your light continuously goes around and around and around. Each time it interacts with your molecule. And this is what causes this very large signal amplification, which enables our very high sensitivity. So why does this resonance wavelength shift? So actually, theory for this has been around for a long time, since 1945. It's actually first order perturbation theory. It basically states that your wavelength shift upon particle binding is essentially due to the polarizability of your particle. So your particle enters your evanescent field. Your resonator expends energy to polarizes, polarize it. This causes a change in your resonance frequency. And but this is something that has never been tested before at the molecular level, because the signals were masked by noise. And what makes this? These experiments so hard is that your signal strength scales as r cubed, which is your particle volume. So that means it's eight times as difficult to detect something half as small. So to detect something half as small, you have to actually significantly improve the signal to noise ratio of your system. So if you were to detect a 2.5 nanometer radius particle, which is about the same size as a protein, single protein molecule, you would have to resolve a wavelength shift less than 0 0.006 femtometers. So that is one part in 10 to the 12th. So an analogy I like to make is that for those of you who are in this room wearing wristwatches, you might have a quartz crystal inside. And your quartz crystal might make your watch accurate to one part in 10 to the 6, so that's one second in a month. So this would be one second in a million months or one second in 100,000 years. So in terms of optical frequencies, atomic clocks have been shown to be stabilized to one part in 10 to the 18th and in a commercial setting to one part in 10 to the 14th. So these small shifts are something that should be possible to see even in sort of a complex environment such as a biosensor. And as a further point of comparison, a Rolex, which is advertised as the most accurate, best mechanical movements ever, 
that's accurate to one part and 10 to the fifth, but at a great expense so for thousands of dollars. So these are some recent advances people have made in the field. So microwing resonators are capable of picomolar detection. This is IL-2. As I mentioned earlier, this is a cell signaling molecule, so you can see you can get picomolar detection. The way you interpret this graph is this is time, this is wavelength. So as they put increasing concentrations of interleukin-2, you can see um, your resonance wavelength shifts to, to longer wavelengths um, and in a concentration-dependent fashion. This is an optofluidic ring resonator in the lower left-hand corner. It's essentially a glass capillary. You flow liquid, your analyte through the capillary, you excite resonances around the rim. And this is picomolar detection of HER2, which is a protein that's very important in breast cancer. So that's very nice, but it's not a single molecule. Here, these are microspheres. They've been shown capable to detect single viruses. So you, you, your sphere is at one particular wavelength. A single virus lands on it, it shifts to another wavelength. Another virus lands on it, shifts to another wavelength. And this is what generates this staircase-like graph. It's this, these sort of um, discrete shifts in their resonance wavelength due to the individual binding of particles. And so that's very nice, but you'd still have to get down another 6,000, a factor of 6,000 in terms of mass to get down to single, detecting a single protein. So in 2011, the Vahala group published a paper in which they detected 25 nanometer polystyrene beads. And so that's about nine atograms in terms of mass. And so you'd have to still go down another factor of 100 in order to get down to a single protein. And so recently what people have been doing is they've been using plat plasmonic enhancement to sort of boost the signal-to-noise ratio of these devices. So this includes putting gold nanoshells, gold nanorods on these particles. And this is several advantages, but namely you get larger sensitivity. But the main disadvantage is that there's very little surface for, their, for particles to bind. So you have a very, very, very limited capture area. And so the ideal thing would be to take the thin ribbon of light associated with a bare microcavity because then you have thousands of times the capture area. And so this is how we fabricate our devices. Um, it's actually a rather straightforward fabrication procedure. It doesn't involve a lot of complicated steps. It's just some photolithography, some wet etching, um, some dry etching, and finally, at the end, we fire polish. So we start out with silicon wafers, which have a two micron thick layer of thermal oxide, which is what we um, purchase. And then we do some photolithography to pattern circular pads of photoresist. We do a hydrofluoric acid etch to etch away the areas that are not protected by the photoresist. We rinse off the photoresist. We do a xenon difluoride etch, which is a selective silicate etchant, which etches the silicon but does not touch the silica. And it's a very, very smooth etch. And then this forms a structure known as a microdisc. So you can see that they already have pillars of silicon, and our detection area is silica glass. And then we do a CO2 heat laser illumination, which is essentially we heat up our structures and they collapse due to surface tension. This eliminates all the blemishes that you get from lithography. and You get these very, very smooth um, surfaces so you're not scattering light out. And this helps um, create our very, very high Q factors. So this is an array of these devices and I'm going to show you a video. So this is, you're looking from the tops, so you're looking here. This is where it's known as the disk structure. This white is the silicon, this is the glass. And you're going to see the CO2 laser hit it and then you're going to see it collapse and form a toroidal structure, or what we call a toroidal structure. So right there, um, so this is where particles would bind. You're looking at this from the top. And where it flashes very, very bright white is where it gets very hot. So this will play again. So this is our experimental setup. So we have our device. This is looking from the top. We evanescently couple light in using an optical fiber. This is just an artistic rendering that we've done. So these are experiments. They're not in vivo. They're not done in your body. They're done in vitro. So they're on a sample stage. And then we just flow solutions of interest with whatever biomarkers um, that we're interested in, for example, over our setup using a syringe pump. And the way people typically do these experiments is that they have a tunable laser and they're continuously scanning to find out what the resonance frequency of this device is. So they scan it, they scan again, again and again. And our, what we do is a little bit different. We lock the frequency of our laser to a resonance in our microcavity, and then as particles bind and shift our cavity off resonance, we measure the amount of voltage our laser controller has to apply to follow and stay on resonance. And then we can convert this voltage to a wavelength. And this has several advantages. One is that we're always on resonance as opposed to continuously sweeping past resonance. So we can more accurately track the peaks where more, we can look at smaller events, more transient events, and um, we have higher sampling times, which enables us to perform more averaging. 
So this is what our system is. Um, I call this FLOWER, which stands for Frequency Locking Optical Whispering Evanescent Resonator. So it's a laser. You send your light to a 50-50 beam splitter. Half of it goes to the toroid. Half of it goes to an auto-balanced photoreceiver, which effectively eliminates noise due to laser intensity fluctuations. Uh, we multiply this with a dither signal, which is just a sinusoidal waveform, which allows, enables our controller to tell us whether we're on resonance or off resonance. And this generates an error signal, which is fed into a proportional integral derivative controller. And then we output this to 24-bit data processing, uh, a data acquisition card. And as I mentioned, this enables us to continuously stay on resonance and sample more points per second, which enables more averaging. And um, our patent for this has been issued, and the option to license has already been sold. So. So we also do some data processing. We do some filtering to improve signal to noise. So this is an example of uh, exosomes, which are cancer biomarkers. They're essentially vesicles. So you can see this is a lipid bilayer. And they're very challenging to detect because they're mostly filled with water. So there's very, very low contrast. Um, and so this is where we're detecting individual exosomes. They're about 30 to 90 nanometers in diameter. So you can see we have one exosome which binds to the surface of the toroid another exosome binds, another exosome binds, and so on and so forth. And these sort of bursts we sort of interpret as sort of frustrated binding where something is attempting to bind, but not, it's not a complete binding event. And the reason why these are binding to the surface of the toroid is because we coat these with antibodies to make it for selective capture. So in these membranes, they have specific proteins, and then we have antibodies for those proteins. And so we do some further median filtering to further isolate our signal. And this is just to show you, um, this is just a comparison of uh, before and after we apply frequency locking, we see a significant drop in noise in our noise levels after after we apply our um, frequency locking. Is there a standing wave in the ring, or is it uh, propagating in one direction? A standing wave. Is it standing wave? Does it matter where the particle binds because it binds to a peak of intensity versus the value? Does it give a different signal? I don't. I don't think it matters where it binds because the light is going around and around. So it's it always is sampling it. It always sample the. So the it's a standing wave, but it's uh, moving around. Yes. Okay. So th this is. These are some examples of um, beads that we're binding. So these are 10 nanometer radius polystyrene beads. Um, and so you can see once more that the bead lands, changes the resonance frequency, another bead lands, changes the resonance frequency, and so on and so forth. And we can generate a histogram of these step sizes. So this histogram is sort of the height of each of these steps. And we use this to make comparison to theory. So you see this histogram has sort of a spread, and that's due to two things. One, that your particles have a natural size variation of the particles that you purchase. And two, if you look at the, this is a COMSOL simulation of the light within the, within the cavity, and you can see that the electric field intensity falls off on either side. So you can see that. And so this, the shift that you see is dependent on the electric field within the device. So when a particle binds to the center, you get a larger shift than when it binds to the sides. And so when we do comparisons to theory, we always base it on sort of particles landing at the equator, because you can't get a shift that's larger than when it lands at the equator. So we always do a comparison to sort of the maximum shift that we see. And so this is another um, example. We were looking at biological particles, where we were looking at ribosomes. And so in this case, ribosomes, they're uh, less polarizable than polystyrene, so they're more difficult to detect. And so they're very, very important, because they link uh, amino acids together to form proteins. So they're sort of a very, very important biological uh, particle. And once more, we were able to get good comparison in terms of step sizes with theory. Um, okay, so here, here we're getting down very, 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 very small particles. We're getting down to two and a half nanometer radius, which is essentially the same size as a single protein. Um, and you can see that when you zoom in, you can sort of see these sort of tiny, tiny steps, and that if these steps, and when we vary the concentration, we can we get more steps, which is what you would expect if these tiny fluctuations are due to the binding of um, particles. So if you increase the number of particles, you should see an increase in the number of steps that you see. And so we notice that we actually see more unbinding events in this system, and that's because our thermal forces are now uh, approaching to or exceeding our adhesion forces. And so we went down, these are, these are single protein experiments. Um, you can, once more, you can see discrete fluctuations, which have good theoretical agreement. And once more, when we vary the concentration, we can vary the amount of binding events that we see, which is what one would expect. 
So this is our comparison between theory and experiment. The solid lines, the solid lines represent the different, uh, the different dielectric, what we call a dielectric factor, which is simply a, um, it's this term right here, which is a combination of the index of refraction of your environment and the index of refraction of your particle. And so you can see here the black line represents polystyrene beads, the green lines represent biological particles, and the blue line represents uh, silica. And so you can see we have agreement over several orders of magnitude of particle size and for different materials. And another thing, interesting thing to notice is that the slope of this line is, of these lines are three, which is what one would expect as your signal shift goes with um, your R cubed volume, particle volume. How do you get the index of refraction of the right side? Oh, well, <laughs> so there, there, there are people that study these sort of things, so yeah, for like proteins and whatever. But we, we, we did sort of assume sort of a, the same index refraction for all the proteins. That's why, it, yeah, yeah. And but, so. And what is the index of refraction? So that's not the index of refraction, that's the number of particles. So that's the number of data points. So Ed in this case doesn't refer to index of refraction, it refers to a quantity of, part of experiments, number of experiments. So in this case, it's three. This case, it's three. This is four. This is 19. This is two. Um, so yeah, so exosomes were done in red because uh, at that time, I didn't know what the index of refraction of an exosome was. But um, since then, other people have alerted me to papers um, or work that they've done themselves with the index of refraction of an exosome. Uh, yes. No, it, uh, it scales as your radius cube, so it scales as your particle volume. So it scales as your particle, the volume of your particle, which is why the, the slope of the line is three. Um, so this is the first application we did, which was a minimally invasive tumor biopsy. So this is something known as a liquid biopsy. So th this is, you're looking at the circulation of your blood, so biomarkers released from uh, cancer cells. And the idea is if you can sort of exploit the circulation of blood and look for these biomarkers in your blood, you can determine whether a tumor is present and how far that tumor has progressed without actually having to find an access to that tumor. So without actually uh, having to have surgery and, and have a biopsy. And so the first example we did were these exosomes that I had previously shown you uh, data on. And these exosomes have cancer-specific antigens. They are little bits, essentially, of your tumor membrane. So they carry parts of the tumor with you inside your bloodstream. And what we did was we took a mouse and we implanted it with a very aggressive uh, human Burkitt's uh, lymphoma. It's a very aggressive growing tumor. And we planted that inside the mouse. And then every week we took samples of blood from the mouse and we floated over our resonator. And so this is just to show you how these exosomes are formed. This is a cell. Um, you have proteins on the sort of on your cell membrane and then this invagination occurs and then they're sort of expelled and so they carry with it little bits of the cell in your in your bloodstream. And so this is important for basic studies and we're looking interested in it, look for trace detection of cancer biomarkers. And this is some capture agent immobilization chemistry. So this is so we covalently link antibodies to the surface of our resonator, um, which is how we get these exosomes to bind to the surface of our device. Um, so this is, so this is, we float our samples over for each week. So we have, you know, weeks zero through five, and you see this increasing shift, uh, presumably as more of these exosomes are binding to the surface of your resonator. So you see for week zero, um, you see relatively little shift in comparison to week five, which is at, at that point where we had to euthanize the mouse. And you can see if you do the control experiment of a mouse with no tumor, you don't see this increase in um, wavelength from week to week. And if you zoom in on week five, you can see, or actually any of the weeks, but in this particular case, week five, you can see these sort of discrete binding events, um, these step-like events as individual exosomes are binding to the surface of these resonators. And we can once more get a histogram of sizes and pull out theoretical uh, predictions for the size. And so in this case, we got a size of uh, 40 nanometers, or radius 20 nanometers, which corresponded with an independent measurement using field flow fractionation. So this was an experiment that we did blindly. So field flow fractionation is they, you know, you apply an electric field and particles separate out based on their mobilities. And so um, I told them the size, they didn't tell me what size they had, and then later we compared. So that matched up. So where do we go from here? So it's a very, very versatile sensor, and we're interested in looking at a wide variety of applications. So these are a sample of some of the ongoing projects in my lab. 
So one, we're looking at improving the selectivity and sensitivity of these devices. We're very interested in these for clinical applications. So in particular, if we're looking at clinical applications, we're interested in having zero false positives, uh, more importantly, zero false negatives. Um, the rationale behind that is if you had a false positive, you might go get a second opinion, but if you have a false negative, uh, someone tells you you don't have a disease, you might not seek out that second opinion and could have potentially fatal consequences. We're looking at early detection of Alzheimer's, so we're, we're looking at um, blood-based assays for Alzheimer's. So right now, what's currently out there are some very invasive cerebral spinal fluid tests. Um, we're looking at early detection of cancer. This is um, work that Jaden in my lab is looking at, where we're looking at circulating tumor DNA within our bloodstream. Um, we're also looking at uh, performance-enhancing drug detection. This is some work that Errol Posak in my lab is doing, um, where es essentially athletes are doing things where they're microdosing, so they're microdoping, where they're, so they're doping right below the detectable limits of these sensors, and so uh, it becomes a game of how good of a sensor you can make. And particularly with events like the Olympics, you have a large amount of national pride and money that's involved in these events, and they're also taking diure di diuretics to really lower the concentrations of these drugs in their, in their urine. Uh, we're working on portable diagnostics, uh, chemical threat sensing, uh, water safety, food safety, uh, environmental monitoring, basic biological functions like protein folding, and some basic resonator properties. And so... This is one of the projects that uh, Errol in my lab is working on. We're, we're looking at further improving the sensitivity and selectivity. And so um, this is the work where we're encapsulating these devices with these lipid bilayers, and we're putting these G-protein coupled receptors um, in these bilayers. And the idea is that these receptors are targets of 40% of medicinal drugs, so we can use this for drug screening. Um, and when a small molecule binds to a GPCR, it causes a conformational change in the um, in, the GPCR, which induces a change in the thickness of your bilayer. And the idea is that this, this thickness change will be much easier to detect than a single small molecule binding to the surface of the resonator by itself. And so we believe that toroids are a very sensitive way to detect this change. And so Errol's recently been showing me some data where he's been putting membranes on these devices and he's doing some uh, photo bleaching assays to show that once he photo bleaches it, the membranes can recover and that they actually exist on the surface of our resonators. Can you repeat that again? So when a, when a ligand binds uh, to lipid bilayer, it causes a shape change, which actually perturbs the bilayer itself. And so this, this change will be a larger, a larger change than uh, just one small molecule binding to, to the device itself. Do you get more water, less water inside? Um, water? So actually, there are a variety of theories as to what causes this sort of optical thickness change. One, one, is, one is what water. This, this concept of water, um, but it, it's basically this, this motion is this, it's a shape it's a shape change which causes the bilayer to be perturbed. So this is the anti-doping science stuff. So Errol also has some very nice data that I didn't put in here about detecting HCG, um, which is also known as the pregnancy hormone, and. Um, so this is liquid biopsies. This is work that Jaden in our lab is doing where we're looking at circulating tumor DNA. So Jaden's been doing some work where he's been functionalizing um, these devices with complementary strands of DNA to pull out um, DNA shed from tumor cells. And right now we're targeting um, prostate cancer. That's actually a very good system for us because we can simply look at like the reoccurrence of prostate cancer. And in, the, in those situations, we shouldn't see any of this um, tumor DNA from the prostate cancer. And this was a project we had a high school student working on um, where he, he built this portable smartphone. So this was not the sensor, but this was, he was sort of going out into the field and getting uh, samples of water. And so he, he built this portable smartphone just to look at his samples. And we were interested in looking at blue-green algae and pollen in the air. And this is portable diagnostics. This is stuff that we're um, doing with Ewan where we're interested in miniaturizing these sensors so that we can give them sort of EMTs in an ambulance or you know, a soldier on a battlefield. So in conclusion, we've significantly improved the signal to noise ratio of these devices. We've demonstrated detection over a large range of particle sizes using beads. Um, we've detected several sorts of biological particles. We've looked at ribosomes. We've looked at a non-invasive tumor biopsy system. We looked at human exosomes and serum. And sort of the theoretical step sizes we see are in agreement with single molecule detection. I like to acknowledge the following people. 
uh, my current funding sources. And I'd like to say thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>